Story 1. I worked at two McRestaurants. I'm not going to reveal which McRestaurants these may be, but you may work it out. The first was in my hometown before uni for six months. The second was in my uni's town for 18 months. The two McRestaurants had differing its systems. One had an online system. The other just had paper, and so I couldn't simply be transferred. I had to resign from one, get fast-tracked through application at the other, and the people who McTrained me had an easy few shifts, lead up to being told what to comply to. Now, the first McRestaurant was very strict, but a bit too easygoing. I had good customer service, so I was put on the tills every shift. I could combat every Karen with enough sarcasm and fake boomer humor to make them like me. When working on tills, the managers gave the till users their swipe cards so we could issue refunds quicker or delete an incorrect item on the order when a customer changes their minds ten times. All is good. Each shift I walk in, count the McMoney, do my job, cash the McMoney, go home. I was almost always perfect to the penny. Until one shift, I noticed a coworker using my till during my break. When I cash the McMoney that shift, I'm down by like a fiver and a few pence, and I'm given a cash retainer disciplinary and basically a pop quiz about cash handling after doing so. I mention the other coworker to a manager, and he tells me it's my fault for not constantly supervising my till and for not locking my till during my break, which I didn't know I could do. He happily shows me. Cool and good. He's nice and even shows me the legal writing that says I cannot leave the till from counting to cashing unless the till is locked. I can comply with that. The night I am finally forced to use this knowledge. A year later. New store, new managers, same legal stuff. I offer to take a co-worker's shift so I can afford to eat next week and end up on a shift with a manager who has never asked me to go on a till before. Which is weird. I'm great with customers and despise cooking McFood. This time, though, she was expecting the other worker but had already gotten the McMoney ready. I take it from her, count it, sign it off, and do my job. I start learning that she is working everyone hard while she picks her nails and checks her phone. After a while she notices that we haven't had any orders for a little while and that I'm just standing watching her procrastinate. Stop standing around and do your job. Air? I am? We have no customers so I can't serve anyone. She tells me to get stock for the kitchen. What? I thought you wanted me to do my job. Yes, do your job. By the book, McManager? Yes. Okay, no problem. I will stay by this till like it says in the book, duh. I continue to stand there and she gets irate. Look, McManager, the only way I will leave this till is to go on my break. She rolls her eyes and leaves me alone. Yay, about an hour getting paid to chat with the customers and co-workers who are nearby the till. Eventually, I'm asked to go on my break, so I lock the till as per usual and do so. A co-worker of mine, someone who used a flexible till next to mine, while I was on break a flexible till is signed off by a manager said that while I was on my break she came to the till, got angry tapping the screen for it to do nothing, and stormed off. When I came back from my break, I asked for her manager card. No, it's for managers only, and you're just a till boy today. Wow, okay, is this an extended break? What? No go to your job. I'll be able to if you give me the manager card so I can unlock your till and do my job. To be honest, you can supervise since it's your card. Again, she rolls her eyes, goes to the till with me, holds out her manager card, and I have to swipe it while she was still holding it because she wouldn't let go. The screen becomes responsive again, and I unlock it. She seems to avoid me for the rest of the shift, while I just chill since it wasn't too busy. I have time for a proper laugh with some customers, and I even have a drunk friend come in for a milkshake. She and I chat for a while and talk about the weird McManager. End of my shift, the McManager is suddenly very nice and sweet, and offers to take my McMoney and count it up for me, so I can go home early. Ha ha. No. I'm paid to the minute and want to cover my own arse, so I count it myself. Not quite perfect. Three pence over, I probably just didn't give a few people their penny change when they walked away. But for a cash retrainer, it has to be plus slash pound one. I'm chill. 
It was satisfying to irritate her so much while I took the role of procrastinating away from her for that shift. I was grinning on my way home that I had done everything as I should have and put a manager in her place. I even got a drunk friend buddy to walk home with. Turns out there was more to it. That was the most profitable Thursday evening in months. That evening was hundreds of quid more profitable. A little investigation had been carried out because of this. Then they noticed it was the first Thursday evening in months to not have a perfect to the penny cash amount. Then they noticed that it was me who signed it off, not the normal person. Then they noticed that the signature of the other person didn't match with her signature on other shifts. Far too much for it to be a coincidence. CCTV showed McManager to be taking the Tills McMoney into the office on the usual workers' break every shift. I got in the way of it this time for just doing as told and doing my job by the book. Fired, of course. Fine, of course. I think she spent a small amount of time in prison, but now I see her cleaning the floor in the Colonel's Chicken Restaurant across the street. Also, I probably would have trusted her to look after the till while I got stuck if she hadn't been so rude. Story 2 So this just happened yesterday, and I thought I would share this ridiculous entitlement. So I work as a parcel courier for a company that deals in internationally shipped packages, and I was working my route as normal and was about an hour into my route and I was in a particularly good mood until I reached an intersection with said road Karen. So, for context, the street I was on is very odd. On one side of the road are residential houses and some buildings with businesses and apartments on the top floors, and on the other side was a state highway that has a lot of traffic coming off the highway, as well as cars coming from other streets to get on said highway, since it's one of the only points of entry unless you want to take a detour. It's a big pain in the butt and the infrastructure is not ideal, but everyone knows what to do to ensure a quick and effective commute. So, the intersection I mentioned is somewhat narrow due to all the snow that has accumulated. Road Karen is on the left turn lane at the front of traffic, and a semi-truck is making a left turn onto the street since he wanted to get on the highway. This is when the entitlement starts. As I have said, the road is narrow due to the snow, and the semi couldn't turn unless Road Karen reversed. I saw this coming, but the semi-truck driver made the mistake of thinking this piece of trash would do anything a rational person would do and decided to make his turn. As expected, he couldn't complete his turn due to the Karen Mobile. Every driver behind Karen started reversing because, you know, people got places to be, and this semi gotta go. I kid you not there is about 15 feet of space for her to back up and allow this gentleman and his giant semi to complete his turn. What does Karen do? You guessed it, nothing. She sits there, about 15 seconds pass, and the semi-driver gives her a couple of honks because at this point, it's too late for him to do anything. So now this semi and his trailer are blocking the intersection, and traffic is starting to build up from people coming off the highway and people trying to get on the highway. Guy honks his horn longer this time, and this degenerate poss puts her car in park and goes on her phone. Luckily I didn't have to turn at that intersection, and there was a way to maneuver around the semi at a green light, but it was extremely dangerous because the people turning left couldn't see us trying to pass. So I get to the front and the light turns red, leaving me side by side to Karen. I get out of my van pissed as I see her tapping away on her phone and knock on her window. She looks up at me and I yell and gesture to let her know that she has to back up. The truck has nowhere to go. Trailer Trash Granny keeps her windows rolled up, starts saying what I made out as, I was here first, pointing and gesturing angrily to the ground. At this point the semi-driver starts inching closer and closer to her to scare her to back off, but she doesn't budge. I yell at her this time, he can't go anywhere, you have to back up. Traffic is completely blocked off here. She ignores me and I look up to the semi-driver, throw my hands up and shrug my shoulders to let him know the witch ain't moving. The light turned green and I went on my way. I made a few more deliveries and about 10-15 minutes have passed since the start of this whole debacle and went back to the street on the opposite side of the clog to see if it was resolved and yup, you guessed it. Traffic was completely clogged and messed up. 
I didn't even see the highway, but I'd assume there was a line of cars trying to exit onto that street. Unfortunately, I didn't stick around and went back on my route, so I didn't see the conclusion to this idiotic situation, but I'm guessing the semi-driver called the cops. I wish I had to turn left at that intersection just to see the cops chew that toothless trailer trash road Karen out. Please don't be like this person and consider every other person on the road. It's been over 24 hours since this happened, and I'm still fuming baffled. Thank you guys for listening to my rant. Story 3 Yesterday, June 21st, was National Go Skate Day. As such, many skate parks around the country were hosting competitions for various reasons. Parks were overcrowded, and people who don't normally skate were getting out. Typical holiday stuff. The shop I had been trying to get to carry my skateboards happened to be hosting one such contest at a particular skate park. I decided not to mention the name of the park, as I did not want anyone to go there and look for the individual I'm writing about. This park has some of the notoriously worst skaters' absolute troublemakers. They cut each other off, yell at each other, and fight. If the shop I wanted to see was not there, I would never skate at this park. Being me, I decided to arrive early, hoping it wouldn't be too busy and I could skate around for a bit without any trouble. I was so terribly wrong. I had collisions with four different skaters. Maybe those were my fault. Maybe I wasn't paying attention very well. Maybe it was their fault. I'm ready to let it go, but I'm on edge. I decide to drop into the pool, as it is one of the few spots at a skate park where you go one at a time. As I started skating in circles, just trying to get the feel for this pool and warm up, this individual, who will call Kyle, starts yelling at me from the top of the pool. Whatever, I've only been in the pool for a moment, and I know it's still my turn. Still, this individual, I can clearly make out every word they're yelling. They're saying that I should get out of the pool, as this park is for skilled skaters, and they need to warm up to win the contest that the local board shop is hosting. They claim I suck and have no shot at winning. Whatever, I think. I hate it here. It's time to stop skating and just socialize. I pop out of the bowl by Kyle, and they push me. They tell me that this is their park, and I'm not allowed to skate here. I go to put my board away when my revenge plan kicks into gear. I own a skate company, and everyone seems to think skate companies sponsor anyone who can perform basic tricks. So I figure I'm going to let it leak around the park that I'm here scouting talent to recruit to my team. I go and cheer a few individuals as they do their simple tricks. I call them over one at a time to tell them I'm here scouting talent. Sure enough, within half an hour, people all over the park are coming to me to introduce themselves, asking me about sponsorship requirements and what company I represent. At this point, even if my plan fails, I've just created a ton of buzz at this contest and everyone is talking about me and my company. Somewhere in the mix, Kyle comes to talk to me. They apologize for their behavior earlier, saying they were just excited. I tell them I saw them skating around and that they're really good, exactly the level of skating we need for someone on our team. I plan on keeping an eye on them, telling them not to disappoint me. I ask for their name, and they say it's Kyle. The contest starts and we begin with a best trick event on in a frame. There is absolutely no coordination on who goes when, and the individuals from the shop just tell them to go and start calling out tricks they see on their megaphone. I start closely filming Kyle. Sure enough, they're skating the contest like the troublemaker they were being earlier, yelling at people, pushing them out of the way, and they even hit someone with their board. Kyle ends up doing pretty well landing third place with a big flip over the frame. Somehow, they got beat by a kid that did a tail slide, and someone who did a kick flip into a board slide with a shoe it out. I congratulate Kyle on their big flip, and they tell me it's called a skate event like horse. But for skateboarding, they say they have something special planned. The rounds of skate start, and we do a single elimination bracket. I'm still aggressively watching and filming everything Kyle does. Every time their competitor misses a trick, they make fun of them. Every time they go to throw a trick, they yell something to throw off their concentration. Every time they make a trick, they do a mini celebration. And every time they miss a trick, 
they blame their competitor and push them. Kyle ends up getting knocked out in the third round. They throw their board across the park, nearly hitting someone and storm off for a bit. When they come back, I congratulate them on getting so far. The next event is a race around the park. Kyle isn't even close to being a contender on this one. They're slow, not hitting obstacles correctly, and it seems like all the pressure I'm putting on them is really getting to them. They shove some people out of the way so they can be one of the first to go, but they end up getting crushed by 10-15 people. Every time someone looks like they're gonna do better than Kyle, they start yelling at them and screaming. They even throw sand on the course, probably to make people slide. I decide I'm going to make an excuse for them on this one so they have an easy way out, but also think I'm on their side. I tell Kyle that it looks like they need new bearings as they kept losing speed, but their form was great. Kyle says their mother is being difficult and won't replace their bearings. I tell Kyle I have to go grab something for a company emergency and that I'll be back in about an hour. When I return, I have a video I've made of every time Kyle screamed at someone, cheated in an event, or had poor sportsmanship. It's about 10 minutes long. I wave Kyle over and show them the video. They make excuses throughout the whole video, saying they didn't mean it and that it was a mistake. I tell them that I love how they skate, but I expect better behavior from any rider who might come ride for my team. I say that if they go and make amends with all the individuals they were rude to, we have a spot on the team for them. Kyle says the other skaters worship them and will be happy to see them on the team. They go and try to force the other skaters to say they're cool with them, but one of the larger skaters refuses to go along with it and a fight breaks out. The police arrive and start questioning everyone. The police officer asks me what happened and I show them the video I had recorded of Kyle's poor behavior throughout the day. The police end up arresting Kyle, as several of the other skaters want to press charges against them. I provide the police with the video and my raw footage, and they spend time recording my phone as the video plays. At this point, the shop is packed up and heading out, promising to get back to me about whether they want to buy my products. I'm not going to bother to keep up with Kyle, but I'm sure they'll be facing some consequences for their actions. Story 4 I was playing jailbreak in Roblox and arresting a bunch of criminals. For those of you who don't know how to play, you're a prisoner who steals stuff or a police officer who goes around and arrests criminals. As mentioned, I was arresting a bunch of criminals when I saw this guy randomly telling me that he was going to call Badimo, the creator of jailbreak, if I don't stop arresting criminals. This was the rough dialogue between us since I kind of have short-term memory. Random guy, I'm going to call Badimo if you keep arresting criminals. Me, do it then, it's how you play the game. Random guy, I'm going to call Badimo if I see you arrest one more person. Asterisk me not caring and is arresting criminals as we chat asterisk. Me, why do you care? I'm not arresting you, he didn't steal anything yet. Random guy, I want to buy a car. Also, can I have your key card? Me, lol what? Random guy, also stop arresting criminals or I'm gonna call Badimo. I just kept being amused and nonchalant to whatever he was saying. Random guy, actually, I'm gonna call Badimo. Me, stop being entitled. Then he kept telling me to stop arresting people and me still not caring or giving a thought to him just kept arresting criminals and telling him that you're supposed to arrest people in the game until one of them manages to kill me. So basically this random guy wants me to stop arresting criminals because he wants to steal my key card to buy a car and is threatening to call the creator of the game if I keep arresting criminals in a game where you're supposed to arrest criminals. I even doubt that he even knows the creator personally. Thanks for reading and feel free to tell me what you think. Story 5 Well, Mother's Day has come and gone once again. Children of all types have spent the day annoying their mothers enough that she is pleased to see them either leave or go back to their old routines and just leave her to her peace. Ah. Now I am not a mother myself, but if you have read my first ever post on Reddit, then you all have at least heard of my mother. If not, then let me tell you a tale, 
one of bratty kids, an overworked mother, and her revenge. Sit back, relax, because my mother can break your back. This is entirely true. She's a chiropractor. She actually learned how to break someone's neck and back to know the signs just in case she ever came close to actually doing it. Which, okay, while scary, but she learned it in a university setting on cadavers. So all good. Let's take a look back, way back, to the time of the first stirrings of the Y2K bug, where people believed that the world was going to end in a nuclear holocaust because the computers were going to hit Susan when the year 2000 came around. It was almost the summer of 1999. I was just a twig of a child, mostly gangly limbs and big eyes, and all of 11 years old or so. Our cast for this tale is Anna, my eldest step-sibling. Nancy, the catalyst of this tale. Mia, me, the Bambi-looking gullible fool who should have known better. Luke, step-brother, my age, and he should have known better too. Kathy, younger sister by two years, and Leela, youngest. The baby of the family. Now my mother remarried a man we shall call Roger Green when I was about eight years old. Due to the whole soap incident, he delegated all forms of discipline to her when it came to punishing us all on a whole. So due to her working long 13-hour days to support us all and the lack of allowance for doing chores, because, let's face it, six kids tends to run you dry if you try to keep up with it all. We, the children, started slacking off. This did not sit well with my mother, who used her usual threat of, I will go into your rooms, and whatever is on the floor goes in the garbage. This is something we had heard all our lives, but us younger kids, as in me and all below me, totally believed she would do it. Until this one fateful day. It was gorgeous outside, the sun was shining, spring had brought new leaves to the trees, and all the neighborhood kids could be heard screaming through the streets because the 90s were a time of uncontrolled childhood chaos where parents happily released their spores into the wild and drank wine while they didn't have to think about their little terrors until the street lights flicked on. Unfortunately for us, my mother decided that this gorgeous weekend day was best used for picking up the slack that we let get away from us. She demanded we clean our rooms while repeating that well-known phrase we all knew and despised. We groaned, we whined, we relented and started to comply. But then my sister Nancy, the stone-cold and wisest of the elder sisters, just shrugged and ignored the order. Her and Anna shared a room, practically having one side of the upper floor, which had a wall knocked down and renovated into almost like a mini-apartment sans kitchen, all to themselves. And at the all-knowing age of 13 Nancy and 15 Anna, they both decided they had better things to do that day than listen to our mom. Anna left to go on a date with her boyfriend she made the year before, and Nancy sat in her room on her computer, a giant PC of a thing linked into a separate line so the dial-up wouldn't mess up our phone systems. When we, the younger kids, started bugging her, shocked at her audacity, my sister Nancy said these words. It's not like she's actually going to throw all our stuff away. She paid for it all. She's not just going to toss it all out because that's a waste of money. This is a home, it's not a prison. She's not the warden, and we don't have to do what she says. Then she left us standing there with our puny, impressionable minds totally blown. We didn't have to do what mom said. Is that even possible? My younger sister Kathy and my brother Luke took this at face value and immediately took off. They were 11 Luke and 9 Kathy and had friends waiting on them. They didn't have time to waste cleaning their rooms on an empty threat. Leela, only seven years old, was more hesitant, but was as easily distracted as I was, and we ended up playing with dolls for the rest of the day, totally forgetting about our worries until dinner time. Silence. Dinner was quiet, awkward. Mom was upset the house did not get cleaned, and Roger Green was ready to lay his hammer down at my mother's command. The interrogation went as expected, and Kathy, our more, erm, expressive sister who had a bit of a Raphael from the Ninja Turtles type personality, blew up figuratively at my mother. This is a home, mom, not a prison, and it's my room. With this, dinner was concluded. Kathy stormed off. Mom went quiet and with the most Stepford wife smile ever just asked us all if we felt this way. My elder sisters agreed immediately, not really caring because of teenage angst. 
and we younger kids slowly nodded at their insistent stares. I see. And that was that. No punishments, no scoldings or groundings, and the rest of the weekend went off without a hiccup. We should have known something was up. Mom sent us all off to school Monday herself, which was unusual because she usually woke before us and was gone by the time we finished brushing our teeth. We then wouldn't see her until dinner later in the day, but she made us a big breakfast, hinted at a surprise for us when we get home from school, kissed us goodbye, and sent us happily out the door. Now I am sure you are all thinking that I should get on with it. What was the revenge and how does it fit into pro? Well, I'll tell you. Mom's revenge. While we were at school, Mom, Roger Green, and some of his friends came in and got rid of everything that would be enjoyable to a child. The basement was emptied and cleaned, all computers, video games, handheld gaming devices, CD players, radios, and TVs were taken. Dressers and closets were emptied, toys upon toys were tossed, colorful blankets and sheets removed from beds, decorations, pencils and coloring tools, papers and scissors, glue. Basically any and all craft supplies, gone. When we returned home, Roger Green was in his military uniform and accosted us as we came in through the door, pinned us to the wall, and frisked each of us. Backpacks, candy, and everything we had on us were taken. My mother then handed us some gray pajamas and ordered us to march into the bathroom to change. Terrified, we complied. The living room seemed so bare. The piano recorder was gone, along with the TV. The puzzles and games usually kept in the room gone from the shelves. The bathroom was no better. Bare except for shampoo and a bar of soap on a string for some reason. It smelled strongly of bleach. We were then sat down on lawn chairs, the couch occupied by my stone-cold mother, as we waited for every child to arrive in silence. Welcome to the month of torment. We watched as my mother tossed all our clothes into a garbage bag. All toys and art supplies from our backpacks followed, and Roger Green was in uniform and with his scariest expression as my mother went through our new itinerary for life from now on. Wake up at dawn, physical training in the mornings through the town led by Roger Green. Oatmeal, no sugar, for breakfast then off to school. Drop off made to the classrooms by Roger Green and pick up the moment the bell goes at the end of the day. Lunch is roast beef sandwiches, barely any mayonnaise and wilted lettuce. School has been informed to not give us anything else and to take away anything not given to us by our parents. Once home, we are each assigned a room to clean, our bags taken and checked for contraband, room clean, physical training on the backyard, a deflated soccer ball as a toy, nothing else, leave the fenced-in area and you get extra punishment. No friends, calls, or escape. Dinner was cold peas, corn, beans, and mystery meat. No butter, salt, or ketchup allowed. You don't take care of your home. You don't deserve your home. Welcome to prison. Homework was done at the table, use of pencils and paper regulated and inventory counted. Bedtime was at 6, lights out at 7, and the doors locked until morning. Bathroom must be used before bed, or you have to go in the pot put in your room. It is up to you to keep it cleaned. We had two sets of pajamas we went to school in, all gray, and a set for bed. It was up to us to keep them clean. Uniform must be maintained, hair must be maintained. Our grades must stay high. No excuses, no exceptions. By the time a week was up, she had broken us. Nancy and Anna had stayed stubborn, but even they broke by the second week. Then the appeals. You want release? Write us an essay on why you think you're ready to return to society. Then an interview to determine leniency. Myself and my younger sister Leela managed to be allowed outside beyond the yard. It took several days for the others to follow. By the end of the month, we were ready to do anything my mother asked us to. Then on the same day as last time, she and Roger Green came into our rooms and dumped garbage bags upon garbage bags. Every book to every building block was in there, marked with our names. All our stuff was brought back, and my mother dumped them all out onto the floor and said, When I come back up here, whatever is on the floor goes in the garbage. We cleaned that stuff up fast. We never ignored our chores again. 
Story 6. I might have posted this story on Reddit when it first happened, but to clarify, this was a few years back in the time before the COVID pandemic, just before Christmas. Everything that's about to unfold took place with all the characters bundled up in heavy winter clothing. The story. I was on my way home after spending a few months at a boarding school and was taking the commuter train from the capital back to my parents' house. I had already been traveling by a long-distance train for almost five hours and was, understandably, exhausted. When the train arrived, it was already packed, and a crowd of people poured in. I could have waited for the next train, which was due in about 15 minutes, but I knew it wouldn't be much better in terms of space. Once I boarded, I noticed a woman who I'll refer to as Karen, a woman likely in her 40s with her two young children, who looked to be under eight years old. They were taking up a total of seven seats on a train that would have been crowded even if four additional seats had been available. She made no effort to have her children sit properly, allowing them to lie across two and three seats each, even as the train grew increasingly full, with more people standing than sitting. Feeling a strong urge to take a stand, I planted myself right in front of her, holding on to one of the train handles and positioning my large coat and bulky backpack squarely in her line of sight. I realized I was probably blocking part of her view of her phone, but I didn't mind. Could I have taken my backpack off? Certainly. It was crowded, but I didn't strictly need to keep it on in the warm, cramped train. I then proceeded to make that 20-minute train ride as uncomfortable as possible for Karen. Each time the train shook or rumbled, I would accidentally bump her with my backpack, step near her feet, or swing my bag in her direction. About five minutes into the ride, she tapped my back, and I heard her exclaim, Excuse me, your backpack is hitting me. Feigning as much politeness as I could muster, I turned around sweeping the straps across her again and said, Yeah, it's pretty crowded here, not a single seat left. It felt immensely satisfying to turn away, ignoring whatever response she might have had. At one point, I even tried to see if I had a little gas saved up to make the ride more unbearable. But, alas, I'd eaten a little too healthy that day. I kept up the silent protest for the entire 15 minutes of that ride. Even when seats opened up, I stayed put. Could I have chosen to be diplomatic? Sure, but I felt like she didn't deserve the chance to make things right. She had been on the train longer than I had, and the space was already cramped by the time I boarded at the Capitol. When my stop came up, I briefly considered staying on the train to keep up my performance for a few more stops. But instead, I decided to get off and head home, as I exited, I noticed her glaring at me through the window, so I flashed her a smile and, unfortunately, my middle finger. When I shared the story at home, I got mixed reactions. My dad seemed proud, my younger siblings praised me as a hero, but my mom thought I was justified up until the point when I made the gesture. I didn't quite get it, I mean, I had been bumping her, stepping near her feet, and jostling my backpack around, but a little gesture was too much. I'm open to any judgment here. I've had friends tell me things like, you don't have kids, she was probably tired too. You can't just bother someone for being rude, but they're in the minority. <laughs>